Okay. Um, the way I figured it, there'll be 40 multiple choice questions, um, about four calculations. The calculations will be MPC, M, uh, MPS, um, the increase in GDP, um, and doing that. I've counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven questions on aggregate demand, and that includes um, why is it downward sloping, just like the demand is downward sloping. So that's the real, uh, in the real balances effect, you know, those three different effects. Um, there's one, two, three, four, five, six on aggregate supply. There's shifting, about five questions on shifting. Eight questions on fiscal policy. What would you do if this? Um, three problems on, um, three questions on problems with fiscal policy. Two on interest rates, two on profit. So remember when um, we were talking about um, short term and long run, about profit. Um, so look at those slides. It's on aggregate supply right in the beginning in the short run and long run. Um, one on the Phillips curve. I might change that. I doubt it, though. I'll probably just keep the one. Um, I'm surprised I only did that. Uh, two on inflation. And then that's like uh, demand pull, cost push inflation. And that's about it. So it's 40 questions. Um, the FRQ, um, I actually had four of them for a problem. What we'll do is probably one FRQ problem, but it will include everything. It'll be... Uh, Draw the aggregate supply and aggregate demand. Draw the Phillips curve. Um, GDP is C equals uh, GDP equals C plus I plus G plus NX, and then uh, fixing the gap um, and shifting the curve. And so it'll be all combination. So it'll just be one problem because Wednesday's a short day, um, and then multiple choice will be forty, and that'll be on Tuesday. Tomorrow we'll do some kind of review. Um, won't collect the homework. I might check it off and see who has the homework. And then you'll turn that in probably on Wednesday, just to give you time to study and look at. So what questions you guys have? So you can type them in or ask them one at a time. I'm glad you muted everything, but if you want to unmute, ask the question and then go ahead, or if you want to type it in, that's fine too. So what do you got? Um, on interest rates, looking um, at the problems that you had, they asked questions in the FRQs about real interest rates and how like government spending or shifts in the curve affect that. And I just didn't quite understand when they're talking about real interest rates, like what they're looking for. Well, real interest, I mean, real interest rates are the nominal interest rate minus inflation. Okay. So that's the real interest rate. So if prices are going up, that means, you know, what should happen with interest rates? You should be raising the price just so you can make more, at least keep up with interest rates. So if okay. prices are going up and you don't change your interest rate, then you could lose money. Okay. So you're good. normally you would say when prices go up, interest rates should also go up. Now, what happens when interest gate rates go up? Uh, it's more expensive for lenders to borrow. Um, and if it's more expensive for lenders to borrow, then aggregate demand would go down. So you have to look at that. So know the relationships, what would happen. Just remember, real interest rates are the interest rate plus nominal or however you want to do it. You know, it's how we did it mm -hmm. in class. Um, but just try to remember what it have prices affect interest rates or how they should. And could that lead to stagflation that if interest rates are going up and then aggregate demand moves down? The only thing that leads to stagflation is aggregate supply decreasing. And that's like normal. Okay. Some kind of supply shock is what we had with oil prices. But if you have supply, aggregate supply decreasing, that causes stagflation. Hi, Ashley. What questions you guys got?
So know that formula where the um, multiplier times uh, the change in spending equals the change in GDP. Elena, the problem set will be due. I'll check it off tomorrow. So I'm just going to make sure that you did most of the questions tomorrow and then I'll uh, collect them on Wednesday. Just one, oh, go I, have, I have a question on the difference between the multiplier effect and the uh, spending uh, multiplier. I know like they kind of go together, but I'm thinking of the multiplier effect as you know, if, I, if I spend $30 on a friend's product and they have that $30 profit, is it how much, is the multiplier just like them also having the extra income of $30 or how much they spend or save? Well, the multiplier effect is basically explaining that when you spend a dollar, the dollar goes through the economy one, two, three, four, five times, depends on how much people say. So it looks at whatever you spend, it's their income. So their income increased. So out of their income increasing, they're going to spend some and save some. So then they're going to spend money at a place. That place now has new income. In that new income, they're going to save some and spend some. So the multiplier effect is kind of like just explaining that when you spend money, it actually multiplies through the economy. Now, the multiplier is the exact formula and the exact number. If you spend $1, how many times will it go through? So if your MPC is 0.9, the multiplier is 10. So that $1 will multiply through the economy 10 times. If you're um, saving more money and your, uh, say your multiplier is five, then $1 goes through the economy five times. So one is just kind of explaining the idea and the other is what is the actual multiplier when you have spending, how much will it increase GDP? Oh, okay. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, on one of the practice FRQ questions, it asks, um, should the impact on an aggregate demand and supply curve when there's a sudden decrease in private investment spending? And I didn't know what, which one that would shift because it's not like investment into a business. And so I didn't know if that would be like consumer spending or... Private investment spending is I. Okay. So it shifts aggregate demand. So I is any investment, not just for businesses. Well, that is for business. It's just another way to say it. Didn't okay. say consumers didn't say consumers. It is private investment spending. Oh, okay. It's not government investment spending or anything like that. But just yeah, it is for I. Okay. Yeah, that's why I say I got it. What else? <laughs> When I looked again at those problems with fiscal policy, remember those are the lags. So there's, like I said, there's probably three questions on the different lags, operational lag, administrative lag, timing lag, and those things. Um, questions, anybody? You want to ask a question on the problem, the FRQ? Does everybody have a book? Nobody got a book? Okay. Some people have found that having a book actually helps. But that's not a problem. Has everybody been studying IRAP and uh, C plus I plus G plus NX? Study your shifters. Make sure you know your shifters. Um, so when prices and wages are flexible, and I just have trouble remembering in which way those will move aggregate supply. So... Um, if there's a decrease in consumer spending and prices and wages are flexible, how would that move supply? Would that move, would that decrease supply? Because. Well, 
draw it on draw it in your head draw it on the paper draw it in the air however you want to do it so consumer spending or consumer confidence goes down so that's aggregate demand decreases then okay. you look on your graph and what happened to prices prices went down okay okay so when prices go down inflationary expectations are decreasing what would aggregate supply do it would increase uh and it would go back to equilibrium. Okay. So that ends up with prices even lower than they were during the first shift, right? Correct. Okay. In the long so, run, they're all gonna be always at the ag long run aggregate supply curve. They're always gonna adjust okay. because you have time to adjust. Okay, so, so when it talks about like price and wages being flexible, that's just so it can move back to equilibrium. Right, or it depends on where you start. Oh, well, yeah, they just move back to closer to the original position then. Correct. So if you were in a, if you're in a recessionary gap and consumer confidence is still getting worse, you're going to shift to the left again, and then prices should go back to at least the original recessionary gap. Okay. Cool. Rosie, any questions? Luis, Ashley, Kobe, anything? Uh, from Luis, will we need to know how to apply Keynesian theory on a problem? Uh, I consider fiscal policy Keynesian. Um, so the C plus I plus G plus NX is Keynesian. Um, we're going to have to know fiscal policy. Um, is there going to be on this question? Um, there's one question about the classical range, Keynesian range of the uh, curve, so aggregate supply curve. So if you look at the Keynesian range, if you increase aggregate demand, what is actually increasing? It would be output. If you're increasing aggregate demand on the classical range, what is increasing? It's prices. So that's kind of have to, you have to look at what's increasing when you change aggregate demand. Um, there would be one question on that, on the, that modified aggregate supply curve. Does that answer your question, Louise? Okay, good. What else we got? I have to figure out how I'm gonna have our review, but what I figured for your review tomorrow is everybody will um, have a concept so I'm going to give everybody a concept. Cubs are uh, doing well, so you'll hear the yelling and screaming in the background. Um, <laughs> um, so I'm going to give everybody a different concept, and you're going to walk around talking to people and just talking about the concepts and explaining to people and just going over the concepts with each other. So we're going to try to get through the main ones there. Um, if you have questions on the homework, obviously, you can ask. Um, but I'm here just to help you guys out. You're gonna have to give me a better, uh... okay. Um, I don't know the problems. I don't have the problems in front of me. So normally just kind of like ask the question that you have, but all right. If you decrease corporate taxes, okay. Normally what that means is businesses have more money to invest and they can possibly, they can do a lot of different things. They have a lot of things that they can do, but if they invest in um, plant and equipment and investments, um, then if they do that, then they can, you know, they can make things better. They can make things faster. They can increase short run aggregate supply and long run aggregate supply. So that question there, you could have three things actually increase by decreasing corporate taxes. You can increase aggregate demand, you can increase aggregate supply, and you can increase long run aggregate supply. Because anything that is, I always think it's easier. We got the shifters on the per, uh, production possibilities curve. That is the, um, technology, productivity, um, quality, and amount of labor, 
those things shift the aggregate supply they shift the production possibilities curve outward. They also shift the long run aggregate supply curve. So on that one problem, um, if, if, if your decrease in taxes gets people to invest in plant and equipment that make themselves more productive, that can increase long, long run aggregate supply. It also can increase um, short run aggregate supply. It also could only increase aggregate demand and that's it. Right? So it depends. So um, does that answer your question, um, Elena? Now, if you do interest rates, interest rates also will affect uh, aggregate demand because it'll make investments go up. And if you're investing no in plant and equipment, way. you can also have more productivity. You can also increase aggregate supply. You can make things because that remember what shifts aggregate supply is productivity, correct? So anything that gets you more productivity, you know, that could be automation, that could be new technology, that will shift the aggregate supply curve. That can increase the long run aggregate supply curve. So some of these things can, but they don't necessarily have to. So that's why you have to think it through and think what's going on and also just answer the question that it asks. Um, and remember that one FRQ that we did, it had three possible answers. And that's probably like the one you're saying on 1C. It, you know, it might not change anything. It might change it. It might reduce it with, with crowding out. So hopefully that answers your question. I mean, some of these, like the taxes, you always have to be careful with the taxes because taxes can affect aggregate demand and can affect aggregate supply. So I try to make sure that I tell you it's personal taxes or it's corporate taxes. So on FAQs like that, where it'll ask like, how does this affect? And then has a list of things they want us to respond to. Is there, are there certain ways you want us to word those or do you just want us to answer the question? What do you mean? Like certain words you want us to use when we're describing stuff or? No. Okay. No. I mean, just want you to answer it. I mean, I'm going to be asking what happens to price level and quantity, what happens to um, aggregate demand, what happens to aggregate supply, and then you have to think it through. And definitely for mine, if it's a possibility, it might be wrong in my answer, but, you know, I, it would be right. I'll, make, I'll read it and make sure that you're thinking right. So if your logic is good, then that's fine. Okay, great. What else we got? don't even know anything for the shifter of the long run aggregate supply, right? I normally don't. I didn't see one that is on that. It's normally short run aggregate supply and aggregate demand in, in doing the model. Okay. And it'll give you, you'll be in a recessionary gap or you'll be in a different gap. I even have a couple pictures of a gap. And then you have to say what fiscal policy would you do? What are the two different tools? Expansionary, contractionary. And I think most of you have gotten those down pretty good. What else you got? Any questions on the FRQs? Like I said, it's going to be one that's going to be all together. You're going to have to draw the aggregate supply and aggregate demand, the Phillips curve, and then I'm going to basically have the formula be the same gap. So that's one thing that people didn't understand. But if, if I'm giving you the um, – giving you the wow. uh, the numbers it'll be a gap so then you're not trying to close the gap so i'll say gdp is this and you need to increase gdp by the amount of the gap everybody feel comfortable with the phillips curve and shifting it everybody feel comfortable with um how, how the Phillips curves work? Yeah, just a clarification. If you have a shift in demand, it's a long way hey. on the Phillips curve, and a shift in supply is a shift in demand. A shift in aggregate demand moves the Phillips curve, is a movement on the line on the Phillips curve. 
So if you increase aggregate demand, you're moving basically, say we're increasing aggregate demand, so uh, price levels going up, outputs going up, so you're actually reducing unemployment, so you're shifting, you're not shifting, but you're moving to the right on the Phillips curve. You decrease aggregate demand, you're moving to the left on the Phillips curve. When you shift aggregate supply, say you increase aggregate supply, that means basically if you look at the shift of aggregate supply and it's going to the right, that means prices are going down and output's going down. So that means your Phillips curve is shifting to the left because that's the only place where you can get prices and, out and output increasing. And then the other way also, if you, so it's just the opposite. If you uh, shift the aggregate supply to the left, then the Phillips curve is going to go to the right. Okay. You, just, you just have to look at the Phillips curve and see where does that fall? Where does that go? Um, to me, sometimes if you can't remember it, just look at your aggregate supply curve, what just happened to output, what happened to unemployment, what happened to prices, and then put that on the Phillips curve to see what happened. There won't be multiple shifts in my, like, well, in general on the FRQ, there's going to be two shifts or two changes. On the multiple choice, it's just, you know, just one, one shift explaining what happens. What would you do? And a lot of them are like the last scenarios that we did. You're in this gap. What would you do? You're in this gap. What would you do? What else we got? Everybody understand MPS and MPC? How to calculate the multiplier, how to get that? So for the multiplier, for like you, you'll give us the numbers that we have to use to calculate it? Give you hopefully enough to get to it. I mean, two out of three things, okay. you get the other. Um, normally I give you an MPC. I could give you an MPS, because you can figure if I give you an MPS of 0 0.2, you know the MPC is 0.8. Um, but yeah, you'll have enough. Okay, so then, I don't really have it super clear in my notes. The change in consumption and the change in income, what are the, what's the difference between those two things? Change in consumption is the upper half. It's the top, line, top of the line. And the change in income is the lower line. So I'm saying if I give you a dollar, which is new money, which is new to you, how much will you consume? Oh, okay. So it's a percentage, it's between zero and one. Um, and when we actually, there's no, like if you Googled MPC, all you're gonna get is definitions and all you're gonna get is um, hypotheticals. So we're actually going to try to find it ourselves as we're going through this. One of your projects that I'm gonna have you do is actually give a speech and say, okay, here's how we're gonna fix the economy. So you're going to have to find the change in C, and that could be at B, BEA.gov, and you're going to find out what that quarter, what changed in consumption, and then you have to find out what the income is, and then you do that ratio and you calculate, calculate it. You know, do you want a larger or smaller MPC or a multiplier? What do you think? Um, I mean, I think a larger... I think a larger one would make it easier to do, to make, like talking about governments, or no, a lower one, a lower MPC would make government spending more effective, right? It's hard to say. I mean, a larger one, it means you spend less money. So it's better for the, the deficit and everything like that, or those kind of things. And you, you, uh, people don't want to get into debt and they don't want to get into a deficit. So if you have to spend a lot of money, um, they might be against that. So that's why I say a larger one is better. I think we save about four to 5% of our money. Um, but then you get into the problem of if you're doing a large uh, multiplier, what if it doesn't work? What if it's less? 
what if people don't actually like with George Bush, they didn't actually spend the money, they saved it or they paid off debt. So you have to see what people are doing now. Are they actually spending money? Are, in that, are they in that mood? Is consumer confidence up? Because if you're saying a multiplier is 10, and then people have very little consumer confidence and those numbers are low, they might not spend 90% of their money. They might spend you know, 70% of their money. Yeah. Um, so I always say to be conservative, just to make sure that you're right. So we're ending in 10 minutes. So I'll have to create another meeting if you have any other questions and then we'll do another one for a little bit. So I, it's telling me now we have 10 minutes left. So we've covered quite a bit. So um, whatever you guys think that have been here most of the time, um, if you know, if you're done, you're done, that's fine. It doesn't seem like it'll be uh, full. So uh, your choice, what other questions we got? Elena, Rosie, Luis, Ashley, any other questions? Going, going, anybody? So if you have, um, Let's say your short run, your costs are $25 and you're selling the product at 50. So you have a profit of 25. So your short run like wages and your short run resources are $25 and you sell the product at 50 and you make a profit of 25. If your price doubles to 100, what happens? How much does your profit go up? Does it go up 50% or 100%? Well, what would be the profit? Same number. Your, your short run costs, like your wages are 25, your now sales are 100, what would be your profit? Is that 300% profit? Well, the number is 75. So you'd have to look at it. So you did go from profit of 25 to profit of 75. Because in the short run, prices and wages are sticky and they don't go up. Okay. Now in the long run, same scenario, what happens to your profit? Can it stay the same? So what would happen that 25 would go up to 50. So your prices went up to 100 and your prices doubled and then your cost doubled, so your profit still stays the same. So you have that same kind of, even though it's, $25 profit, now you have a $50 profit because your sales went up from 50 to 100. It really did stay the same. It's the same ratio. It's the same number. So in the long run, so those are like the two profit questions that are going to be asked. And that's from that short run and average supply question that you had. Um, so again, go ahead. on the problem set, it asks about, it says to define sticky and flexible wages and prices. So... That's so what the example that you just gave that was with flexible price, wages and prices because it no. moved. As, oh, that was with sticky. Sticky was in the beginning. The first one was sticky. Yeah. Okay. The second one was in the long run. And in the long run, it's, they're all flexible because we can adjust and change. Yeah. Okay. Now, in classical, in, in the, they would say in the short run that prices would go up in the short run and the costs would go up in the short run. So there would be no increase in profit. Yeah. Um, let's see. And that's basically all I wanted to really go over. Do you guys have any questions? Do you want to go another 40 minutes or are you all set and ready? Or are you done? I mean, I think I'm good. You want to give a vote here in the chat and tell me what you want? Do you want a little bit more 
Are you good? So Elaine is good, all right? And like I said, go over the shifters and then go over the, the real balance effect. Go over those three effects for aggregate demand. So make sure you cover those. And even that one with net exports, remember what happens when aggregate demand goes up, that last problem with fiscal policy, what happens to net exports, it actually can decrease. So Kobe's good, Ashley's good, Rosie's good. Gabrielle is good, Elena is good, Luis. Anybody else? I mean, I'm fine with staying, but I've covered everything I need to cover. Um, Forty questions, um, and we'll go over prob we'll go over questions tomorrow too in class. Okay. Can you say again what you just said about reviewing the shifters, and then what was the thing you said after that? Well, well the. In aggregate demand, there's questions on why does aggregate demand shift downward or slope downward? And it's kind of like just why does the demand curve slip downwards? The substitution effect, the income effect, the law of diminishing marginal return. Well, there's three of those with aggregate demand. So it's the real balance effect, the wealth effect. So look at those things and look at net exports. So there are th reasons why that is. And we kind of haven't reviewed a lot of that but it was mentioned right in aggregate demand so look over those look for the irap and look over c um like i told them there's like a couple questions on profit a couple questions on interest rates make sure you understand the relationships between prices and interest rates and when interest rates go up what happens to investment and aggregate supply and aggregate demand okay thank you all right so everybody says they're good, so I'll see you tomorrow. I'll be uh, dressed up. Are you guys going to be dressed up? Is everybody here? Gabby, or what are you going to be? I think I'm going to wear fairy rings to school. Okay. Uh, Rosie, what are you going to wear? I'll tell you guys. You can't say anything. Don't tell them. Yeah. They're in my study guide. They can know. Yeah, what are you going to be? Uncle Sam. <laughs> you can be on the so I thought it was perfect. I've got the whole thing out there. I voted this Saturday, so I thought it would be perfect. But don't tell anybody it's a secret. So you'll get to have you there. So anybody else? Last questions, last things? A student, very good, Rosie. A stressed student. Um, I actually, somebody who's going to be dressed up as a history teacher, that's Mr. King. <laughs> yeah. I'll dress as senioritis. Oh, very good. Uh huh. You guys, come on, dress up and feel the Halloween. I'm bringing candy. So there we go. All right, guys. See you later. Bye, Mr. Guy. Bye bye. Have a good night. Okay, let's get this on. Stop recording.